Welcome to The Realtor Lady. I'm Michelle Riplogel. Hi, I'm Michelle Riplogel, and I'm The Realtor Lady. And today, I want to introduce Eric Johnson with Sotheby's International Realty in San Francisco. I saw Eric at a small conference about a year ago, right before the pandemic started, actually, and um, I just loved hearing him talk. And honestly, Eric, I'm sorry, I don't remember everything you talked about, but I liked hearing your voice. So we maybe <laughs> need to go into radio. Um, but I also um, have enjoyed our telephone conversations and some of the subjects um, that we talked about, mainly because of your um, sincere care of the client and uh, I just I could just tell you have a lot of integrity and that's what I'm really trying to to bring about in the podcast is to help understand there's a lot of people out there that really care about their success in real estate and um, our very first conversation you mentioned you couldn't get back to me because you were camping and I thought oh camping and I envisioned tents and dirt and you know, campfires, kumbaya, whatever. But you you had a little different story. And and the reason it's so funny is because I haven't really met a realtor that camps. So tell me about your 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 camping story and then I'll <laughs> cool, you were kind of taken back and I was like, wait, no, let's get clear. I wasn't like I was day camping. <laughs> you so, were camping, you said. Came down with I went to the American River with eight friends. We actually went to Sacramento and we're staying in hotels. But then uh, went out to the American River, you know, first thing in the morning, and set up uh, set up the tent and set up everything up and hung out you know, all day until right before sunset. And then we hiked uh, about a mile and a half up a mountain back to our cars and went back to our hotels and showered and went out to dinner. <laughs> That's hysterical because when you were telling me this story, I was like, I don't know any realtor who like tent camps. They have RVs. They do what you do. They have, they go on houseboats and they tell me they've been camping, but there's always a story like yours behind Really, So that was very funny. And I have a full outline of some stuff I want to talk to you about, but you were interviewed by a reporter yesterday about a subject that's very timely right now, especially with the environment the way it is. Can you tell us a little bit about that interview, what questions you were asked and, and how you answered them? Sure. It was uh, you know, a question that I haven't um, broached in a long time. I, I gave a, a, a talk at the Academy of Sciences, San Francisco Academy of Sciences, many years ago, um, about um, how water and water views impact real estate values and how people are intuitively appreciative of the wonder and beauty of nature, so much so that they're willing to pay a premium to look out at that natural beauty from their living room window. So, uh, and I was talking about how when, uh, like the value of a condominium in a high rise, it's right on the water, that you know, looks right out to the bay or the ocean, can sell for 30 or 40% more than the identical floor plan, you know, condo on the backside of the building that's looking at another building or a wall or, um, you know, an internal garden or courtyard. Um, but, uh, you know, the question was more relevant to what's happening in the Bay Area and California right now, which is how we're dealing with um, the effects of, of global warming um, and how, um, how that impacts purchasers' decisions. And I was recently uh, helping a client buy a, a vacation property and we were looking in Sonoma and in Napa and down in Half Moon Bay, uh, Moss Beach, um, two like different types of 
of second home experiences, one that's a beach life, ocean lifestyle, and the other one that's a vineyard lifestyle. But um, it became very clear that um, wildfires are definitely impacting a buyer's decision about whether they're going to invest two or three million or more into a second home that is uninsurable because it is in a zone where it, you can't get fire insurance. Um, <clears throat> uh, at least traditional fire insurance. There are some alternative ones that you can get through the state that are very expensive as well, but then that just brings up a whole set of other, other risks and issues like, um, um, is there well water on this property and how strong is the water flow because it's off the grid and it's not connected to the sewer line? Um, so there are, we're seeing shifts where like parts of Napa and Sonoma are, are selling for 20, 30% more than they did the year before. And there are other parts that are not appreciating as much um, or are depreciating because of where they're located relative to um, any kind of natural disaster that may impact, negatively impact the value. Well, you bring up a really good topic that people don't realize. I mean, just circling back to the conversation of sewer or even septic is that groundwater intrusion and groundwater pollution are so huge right now because, the, right, we, we're depleting those resources as well, but we're also depleting the source of a, of a possible fire return, and we can't use that water. We can't take it out of the the groundwater or out of a well where we would use for fire protection before. I mean, at least down in our area, that's what's happening is being able to use the, the underwater ground storage is, is becoming harder and harder to use. So then something that might've been used for, to, for fire safety, we're losing that source as well. So that. Right. That's a so big when you're living in a drought and then you're also having, you know, uh, fire danger increase and you have reduced ability to fight that fire, then is it worth more or worth less? I mean, are willing, people willing to pay more or less despite that risk? Yeah, you have to truck your water in or you have to- Right, which you might have to be really the expensive over the next year. It's just gonna keep on getting more and more expensive unless we get some rain. I mean, the poor farmers in the Central Valley, uh, California Central Valley are, are just, um, I'm bracing for them. So so you were showing buyers in different areas. Um, can we take that buyer as an example? What, where did they end up going? Did they? Um, so they're a San Francisco family. Um, they've lived here a long time and um, um, they they ended up getting something down on the, on the beach. We made a couple of offers in, in the Napa Sonoma area and um, were outbid and something came on the market. We just swooped in really fast and uh, and grabbed it. Nice. So when you were talking to the reporter, you used them as an example or how did you? Yes. Yeah. I just, I was just explaining how, how directly correlated our environment um, is impacting our pocketbooks. Uh, it's not just like global warming that's happening because a glacier is falling down, you know, a million miles away at the North Pole. It's also that a hillside uh, or, you know, a vineyard or a, a town or a city like Santa Rosa is burning to the ground. And that's just from San Francisco where I, I you know, I, I live and serve. Um, that's an hour away. That's like, you know, 45 miles away. It's not that far. Wow. And um, what else did you talk about with the reporter on the environment? That was, it. that was really the focus. So it was kind of how climate change is actually affecting real estate too. We, we like to think there's all these known elements, but that's actually kind of this unknown. We don't know where it's going and how much worse it's going to get. So that's, Huh. What I'm learning about um, people's um, awareness and when things come into awareness, when people start paying attention, is when um, things that have a negative impact seem to be impacting their personal lives. 
Yeah. Um, and I experienced that firsthand with with the with the George Floyd um, social um, awakening right. and uh, uprising that occurred, where um, I was speaking with somebody who lived in um, um, in a very high end, expensive, predominantly white neighborhood in Arizona, and she was saying that um, they were riding at the Neiman Marcus in Scottsdale, Arizona. And she's like, this is Scottsdale. You know, I mean, and, and so it was such a, uh, a shock because it, that type of issue has always been something that, that people, some certain uh, people only experience through the TV is happening someplace else. But once it's once the repercussions of some thing um, s start showing up in your backyard or at the shopping center a mile away from your home, um, you take notice a little differently and say, "Well, maybe something needs to be done about this." <laughs> um, right. Well, and that's really interesting too. If you if you tie it back to us as being realtors too, because we actually we're there when the personal hits people. We're we're there when the. I mean, not I haven't had this happen where a well runs dry, but I've had people, you know, be affected by things or fire or, and we're there in so many different situations where something comes directly to them with short sales and foreclosures and where something that might be a big thing actually comes to somebody you know and then we work with a breadth of people and we're with them on all of these little actual disasters that happen for them so it's it's interesting that you say that with the environment and that situation too because that's almost kind of our life we go and live with other people we're helping people with other environments i mean literally somebody is coming to me uh saying i want to change my living environment right can you help me find a living environment that's more suitable for the life that I want to live for the, you know, for the next step in my life. Yeah. And then the, what could be affecting is I lately, I still be, I'm still, I'm always involved in seniors and moving seniors and mm -hmm. how it's that conversation that nobody wants to have, but it affects every single family of what are you going to do when you have a family member that can't live with you or on their own anymore? I mean, it, right. it happens and we are, we, you know, I get to do it a couple of times a year where some people never get to experience it or their parents may die, but we, we actually go through all this all the time. Um, well, I had some, I have some stuff I want to get to with buyers and sellers, but let's just go right into the Black Lives Matter because you did some speaking engagements last year and I, I'd love for you to, to tell us some of the things that you talked about and um, brought to the. Hmm. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a lot of answer I can give, but I'll tailor this to real estate more specifically. There was uh, an opportunity I was, uh, I was speaking at the uh, California Association of Realtors um, um, like convention that was online instead of um, uh, being face to face because of the pandemic. And I was just speaking to realtors about how we can make an impact um, on the lives of black and brown and you know people in America by doing something as small as hiring a, a black caterer to cater an event or um, a, um, a black photographer or a black assistant or a black painter, um, you know, to paint a house. There are so many people that uh, are involved in the preparation of a home um, so that it can be presented at its best. Um, and we are the at the helm of this sort of um, this this road to um, getting the home sold. When we're the, we're the ones that decide which painter and which stager and which house cleaner and which gardener and which yeah 
photographer and which videographer. We are responsible for the employing all these people for these jobs. So instead of us looking at what we do is, oh, well, that's about a bigger thing in this world and I'm just one agent. Well, everything happens with one incremental step. Right. And if we can just all take one incremental step towards bringing people of color into our real estate economy, then we have done something. Right. And something is better than nothing. And the other thing that I, I often uh, present is um, there's a, a winery called um, Brown Estate, and they are based in Napa, California, and they are the uh, preeminent uh, African American owned winery. Um, and they are, from what everything that I've read, they are the only black owned winery where they own the land, harvest their grapes, age their grapes, blend and bottle their grapes all on site. They don't, they're not farming the uh, processing out to some, some place else. It's all done in house. And that's a phenomenal way to support a black owned business. When we sell a home and we get a closing gift, all you have to do is go online and order a beautiful selection of wines. The wines are beautiful to taste. Um, the bottles, the labels, the presentation is elegant. And um, it's a beautiful presentation that actually has a meaningful story behind it, as opposed to just going to beverages and more and getting a bunch of wine and saying, here, you know, happy closing. Right. So there, there are ways to support black owned businesses like, like me, you know, call me and, and say, Hey, I need help selling this home. Will you help me sell this home? It, it's, it's, um, it's not charity. It, it is, uh, reaching out beyond one's social sphere to, um, look for excellence outside of the, uh, the realm of excellence that they know of. And, um, I mean, it, it doesn't, I'm not saying go out there and just hire somebody because, because of their color, right. find qualified people that can deliver exactly what you're looking for and hire those qualified people who happen to be black or brown. And that, that's the whole difference. Uh, I'm not advocating that people um, reduce, lower their standards um, to their de detriment so that they can help someone else out. I'm saying run your business and there are a ton of people like myself who are black and brown who deliver excellence all day long. You just have to look for them because they, because we're so few and far between and different, like in my real estate world, um, in the luxury market in San Francisco, I'm, I'm sort of like a destination that has to be sought after because they're not, they're, they're not 150 of us and, you know, black luxury realtors selling in San Francisco. So you've got to look for us. Uh, if, 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 uh, you're not aware of us already, because it's not because we're not present and visible, but relative to the general population, we're not at, you know, our presence is not everywhere. Well, and I could say too, that, um, I think when people look, they don't realize. So, so kind of what you're saying in a way too, is, Hey, when you're looking, you don't have to look for say a black or Brown person, but you can, you can look a little bit beyond kind of almost yourself. And for me, it might be a kind of a, a, a white screen as it were of just looking at what looks like me and hiring somebody who looks like me. But what I would also add to that is to talk with that realtor, it could be yourself. How much in this transaction do you hire other people out or how much do you how much do you kind of pour back into the community as well? Can I hire you and we have a team where I can really build on that because I know as a realtor, I hire a lot of people. And in my community, it would be brown people. And I take care of them and I make sure they get paid and my client doesn't pay them, I pay them because I, I want to support them in the community and they support me. I mean, they, they're just as important to me. So there, there's that, it's that whole trickle down thing too of, of that realtor who really does add a lot to the community. I think they think we get these big commissions and we, 
run around and get our BMWs waxed, but really we do put a lot of money back into the community. We hire people to work on our homes and their homes and and I, you know, I would just like to say, I wouldn't call it trickle down. I would call it trickle out. Oh, I like it. Yeah. You know, there's a difference. There's a hierarchy when it's about down. And yeah. that's really not what this is about. Right. Spreading out kind of money. Yeah, for sure. And that's that with what you talked about with um, California Association of Realtors of just how they can be supportive in their community it is hard to watch sometimes there's not much we feel that we can do or that we're making it right and and so i've heard that so often that i just decided well in some respects that's just a, an easy excuse that people are looking for so that they don't have to do something <gasps> oh, right yeah and then they can feel like oh well well it's too big of a problem i'm just one person i i, I mean there's nothing i can do which is a very convenient answer to, to manufacture. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought instead of, I would just show up a different way and say, well, um, let, me, let me challenge that story and show you how there are things that you can do at, that maybe you didn't think of. Because a lot of this stuff is not about, um, at least from, from what I see, uh, when it comes to the, interpersonal interactions with my clients and or other realtors. I mean, we're in Northern California, so we're in a different environment here um, where I know it, it's oftentimes less about someone intentionally excluding people of color from their business because they don't like them or they don't trust them or they don't want their the wealth to be spread to those people. It, it's less about some kind of intentional exclusion and more of just, you know, everybody's busy. You got kids, you got work, you got like parents dealing with, um, uh, and now you're looking, you're dealing with a house. There's only so much bandwidth people have to, to focus on. And so we all tend to focus on what's closest to us. It's just a natural thing. So I, I just want to be a, a, a force that kind of gives a gentle nudge to help people see that there are some uh, things that we can do outside of ourselves if we just take a little effort. And if if people just take a little effort to find an opportunity to do good outside of themselves and their cultural realm, um, I mean, what what a shift if every single person on this in this country just did a little something once a month. That was an outreach outside of the their their personal sphere. Yeah. Um, well, this might be a little heady for for a little podcast, but are you comfortable talking about any bias that you have received and how you've overcome it? And is it different now than it was when you first started? Oh, I get, I, I I deal with bias every day. Yeah. <laughs> if it's from, if it's not from somebody outside, it's it's from the voice inside my head that is navigating the world and trying to understand where this person is coming from when right. I'm interacting with them. And it seems like an odd interaction. Um, I mean, I live, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, um, I just live life day by day, one day at a time. And I focus on the here and now and if sometimes uh, a day at a time is too much, I focus on an hour at a time or just this moment at a, in a, at a time. Because what I do know for a fact is that all I have is now, yeah. right? Yesterday's gone and who knows what tomorrow's gonna bring. I mean, really, who knows? I may not be here tomorrow or one of my clients may not be here tomorrow or the photographer may, might not be here tomorrow that's supposed to do the shoot. There are so many things outside of my control that my focus um, personally um, as, as a coping skill um, and as a success skill um, and also professionally is to focus on the concept of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's 
still I'm still a work in progress with that one, but just accepting what is and what has been presented to me and figure out what I have control over and what I have control over is not that person or this person or that thing that didn't happen or that thing that showed up in the inspection. The only thing I control can control is the one thing that I have responsibility for and that's myself and how I respond to whatever is showing up. And I can res or as opposed to react, you know, I can react, which is less about being thoughtful and more about just kind of going on automatic pilot based on all the conditioning that I've been, been raised with and then just knee jerk instinctively moving based on that information, or I can take a step back and then consider the source of this information and then decide whether this information is credible and even worth the effort to take any action with. And then once I am clear about that, then I can make thoughtful moves that are in my client's best interests or in my best interests. And so I, I work through life as a black man in America and I work through my business the same way because really it, it's all the same. And, and I, this is, I have no experience being in your shoes. I can only say working with clients of color that I spend a lot of time worrying about them and how they're treated. And, and so from my side of it, I have had clients that I just wanted to make sure that nobody said anything to them, not on my watch anyway, you know, like I felt very protective and I wanted them to be treated just like anybody else. And they're a home seller or they're a home buyer. And part of the experience for me is like you said, you, there's nothing you can do to control and, but that doesn't stop me from just worrying and trying to control it. <laughs> well, that's because you have a, well. That's because you have a, a good heart and a conscious, and you want to you want to be uh, do right for people. I mean, we're in the service business. People come to us as realtors because they want our help, uh, and they have a new vision for the kind of life that they want to live. And we are engaged to help them find an environment that will support the life that they want to live or need to live. Um, you know, it could be a, like, I've got a, a, a client um, there, it's an older couple and there's some health issues and they need to downsize and it's overwhelming. And um, they were referred to me by a, a past client. Um, Actually, two, two people referred them to me uh, independently. And, and I'm so grateful that I am the one who's working with them because, um, I mean, I, I've dealt with, with the uh, taking care of my parents who were both stricken with cancer. Um, and um, I have empathy uh, with uh, timing you know, some people can get overwhelmed in the process of buying a place and you're thinking, well, geez, how come they haven't gotten back to me? They said they love this place and we're, I'm ready to go. But just because intellectually they're ready to go doesn't mean that emotionally they are ready to accept what physical challenges are really um, doing to their life and their future. And that's they really are having to make a move from their big house to a two bedroom condo and a high rise door band building on one floor because they have mobility issues and can't do the stairs. And so all of a sudden they've got to accept the fact that this is happening. And you know, this health thing was not something that they were expecting to happen now that was gonna happen away in the future. So there, there are all these dynamics that we, um, we are dealing with as we help our clients um, wade their way through this, not only business transaction, but emotional transaction, transformation. 
it's weird too. Sometimes I work with people and, you know, it's so intimate, this, this, you, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of having like a baby together and when they're getting this house or this new change and you're just talking every day, two, three times a day, emailing, texting, and then the sales complete and whoop, there they go. <laughs> and you, right. move the next, you know, and you just, it's like you, you move into the next house and help them. Birth. And, and there's, it doesn't happen every, maybe just a couple times a year. I'm like, Oh, I kind of miss them, you know, cause I'd spent so much time with them and it's like, I miss you. And I, I, I mean, we really move on, but that's how much care and how much we're just really in it with them. And it, it's, it's actually really comforting when they don't call, when someone does answers my email. If I email them just this morning, I emailed, how are you? Is everything okay? How did the move go? And they say, great, thanks. And it, I was like, oh, I would have liked to know more, but I'm excited at that, at that short email, right? Because they're good. Yeah. You know? Right, right. I, I was watching this wildlife um, show where, you know, there'll be, um, I don't know, a turtle or a jackrabbit or, <laughs> you know, a baby tiger that has a broken leg and they fix the leg and they, you know, and then all of a sudden they, once their job is done, then the baby tiger or, or frog or whatever, or the bird, they just, and they go and they're gone. And, and the reward or the gratification is in not the non-attachment. Yeah. You know, it's a weird thing. It's like part of part of the grace and the beauty about what I'm doing is that my my job is to help get them set up so they can then launch themselves into their into their life. So yeah, that's what we do day in and day out. And then if we do a great job. <laughs> Um, they always come back. They always show their gratitude by um, using us to sell the home that they help, that we help them buy. They always show the gratitude by uh, referring us to their friends or their next door neighbors or a colleague or who's just you know, somebody who's moving to town. So it's, um, yeah, it's a real interesting bit business and there's a lot of reward. I mean, like anything, not everything is 100% uh, super fun and not every interaction is just like, you know, warm fuzzies everywhere. But, um, you know, for the most part, it is. I've gotten to a, a point in my career where about 96% of all transactions, interactions are good. But, you know, the first 10 years were really rough. I worked with a lot of people who didn't always have the best intentions. And I've been fired by people thinking I did something wrong, but I look back and I realized they wanted to do things that they knew I wouldn't do. They wanted to. Right. And that was a lesson that I learned um, early on. I was so like, I don't understand why this person doesn't want to work with me. I've got, I'm like, have so much to offer and I, I am mastered my, my, negotiation skills and presentation skills and I know how to get them exactly where they said they want to go but um, then I realize it's just like dating and just because somebody out there in the world is looking to date someone doesn't mean that I'm the one and or just like because I'm going out there looking to date someone doesn't mean that the first person or the third person that's introduced to me is the one so it's we're all looking for a fit and, um, you know, water sinks its own level, someone once told me. And that really resonated with me because there can be, I found that there were some really difficult people to work with who were, I was being interviewed, you know, no, working no, with no. each other. Back then I was being interviewed now we're interviewing each other to see if it's a fit and that that's where a big shift is but um i found that some of the most difficult people or challenging people in these in these interviews were the ones that didn't sign me on to to help them 
And then I realized that, that some of these people don't want a competent agent. They don't want a competent professional to lead them where they want to go. Some of these people are micromanaging control freaks. And they actually, regardless of your qualifications, some people actually want someone who is um, less self-directed so that they can direct the, 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 the realtor and like manage the whole thing themselves through the realtor, in which case they're not the cl right client for me because yeah. I'm here to help people who want my brand of help. And if my brand of help um, mm -hmm. and support is not in alignment with what they're looking for, then they may be threatened by the level of expertise that I may present to them because then they may feel like, well, then that, that may be threatening to whatever their personal stuff is that makes them need to control everyone and everything in them lives so they can they can feel okay and safe. So well, yeah, they I can start taking it personally. They can blame us too when it goes wrong, but if we know what's going on and we're we're very in control and not in control of them, but really in control of the transaction and, and really making sure that they are taking responsibility for their decisions. Right. Like, well, I can't blame them when everything goes wrong. They're going to, that's what I've found is that I really try to educate people to, oh, you make a good decision and you're going to be happy and this is going to be great. And it's like, well, I want you to make all the decisions. That, those are usually the people I don't work with so much anymore. It's like, if you want me to right. make, yeah, I'm, we're just not going to. And so what I say is I'm here to give you the best information so that you can make the best decision for you. Because at the end of the deal, when the day is done and I get my check and I go home, you're going to go have to go into that home, open up the front door with a key and deal with whatever you're feeling and experiencing in that moment. So really the responsibility for a lot of these decisions rests on you as the client because I don't know what you want to feel like when you open up that front door and come home after a long day of work. Only you intuitively, innately, emotionally, and logically know what kind of experience you want. So um, all I can do is, is um, be the best guide through the process so that they feel more confident in the choices that they're making. Exactly. And I, but I've learned that the other way too. So just in the last couple of years, seeing how we don't really have physical contingencies anymore and helping them buyers with houses that I'm like, I don't want them to buy this out without physical. I need to do more research on this house. There's just no way these disclosures are going to make me feel comfortable about this. And I've been working with buyers in a way that helps them understand the decisions they're making. And they're walking into a house that I think, oh, man, I that could have used a, another inspector there or a, a contractor. And you know what? They're okay with it. So then I have to be okay with it, too. That That's right. where that, Because that's it's their life and it's their risk. And only they know what they're willing to put up with or not. And we have, as realtors, have no idea what other pressures they have in their life that are motivating them to make their decisions. And I remember like helping a buyer in a situation where there were some, some uh, not so pleasant things that came up in the inspection report. But, you know, if they have an aging parent that needs to move in with them and they have a time deadline, you know, to, to find a place and get it set up for them, you know, that buyer may be willing to take on more risk or something that's less than perfect because it supports enough of their need right now to, um, to accomplish what they're looking for. So that's why I can't make decisions for my clients because I don't know what their risk tolerance is. I don't know what else is important to them that they haven't told me. Well, and I can protect them all the way from getting something that may, like you say, they need in the moment. The other side of that too, and you're in San Francisco and I'm in a 
high rent district. The other side of that is we're looking at the value of dirt and the house is almost becoming irrelevant, really. In, in some circumstances, although now that the cost of construction has gone up so much so fast and it's so hard to find contractors, it's, um, it's an education. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying it flippantly, but there's something in my in my head where I have to kind of learn. I'm just getting them in. I'm just right. I'm just getting in the house in this exclusive place that's just so hard, and there's multiple offers. And yeah, yeah, that's. I had a buyer uh, a couple of years ago. They came down. We looked at houses, and they really liked the fourth one they saw, the fourth house. And we made an offer on it and we got a counter and there was four other counters and I told them what they needed to do to get it. They did it. They got it. So we're, yeah. we're doing the walkthrough and they said, Hey, I've got friends at work who said they've been looking for a house for six months and they're not getting anything. Same market. I said, well, you listen to your realtor. <laughs> It's not a hard lesson. I mean, you asked me what you needed to do to get the house. I told you, you made, but ultimately they made the decision to do that. They got the house. and right. Because they had to feel comfortable yeah. making that choice. But they felt like they had enough information, you know, and I feel like they felt empowered to do that. That's, that's my job is to empower them. It's not for me to tell them what to do. It's to give them enough information for them to put that together to make a good decision, like you were Perfect. saying. Right. And that's really what, to me, what sales is about. I mean, it's not about me trying to convince somebody to make a decision that's not in their best interest. That's fraud, right? Sales is helping people yeah. get what they want, not well, helping people get what they don't want. And I make people sleep on it too. They have to get a gut check because they get so excited. Even sellers with offers, they get so excited. I'm like, no, 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 we need to. Right. We need it. Let's just take a little time and, and let this settle. Well, that's kind of buyers. Let's see. So we know the landscape for buyers, especially in your area. And, and what, what are you saying to sellers? Are you, are you, are, do you have any sellers that say to you, yeah, I'd like to get this price, but I'm interested in this buyer, or I'd, I'd like to see it go to someone who's interested in the neighborhood, or what, what are your conversations with sellers? We hear a lot about what buyers are experiencing. Mm -hmm. What are the conversations like right now? My conversations with sellers are, what's your ultimate goal with this house? And then, then regardless of what other ancillary feelings or wants or particulars that come up, I just keep them focused on that goal, which more often than not is getting the home sold for the highest possible price, right? So, <laughs> right. Um, so um, I help people get out of their own way. Yes. It, um, and I help eliminate some of those distractions so that we can stay focused on the reason why I am here, which is not to sell your home to the nicest person or the, the, um, the family that looks most like you and the other people that live in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. uh, I'm here to get this house sold. I'm here to get your house sold for the highest price that the market will bear. So that way you as a seller can um, use that money that uh, that you made off of this house to fund and fuel the next step in your life. And um, when people get distracted or other things that come in, like sometimes, um, like this one seller we had about 10 or 12 offers on this beautiful house and it deserved every, every one of those 10 or 12 offers because it was beautiful. Um, and the seller started reading the letters. And I'm like, don't read the letter because <laughs> there were two offers that were almost identical. And I'm like, don't read the letter yet. Let's go through all the numbers. Let's go through all the contingencies and the timing. And then I want you to make a, 
business decision based on that information first and then read the letter. But I'm really, I, 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 um, I'm an emotional, caring, thoughtful person. Um, and every aspect of my life, I try to be, I'm not perfect. But uh, when it comes to the deal and the contract and the negotiating, when I'm representing a seller, the goal is to get the seller the most that they can from the market. Um, and so I just try and keep everybody focused there and, and things move a lot smoother. And that family that was looking at the, these two diff different um, offers that were almost identical, once we went through the process and did some counter offers, somebody else came much higher than them. And then that whole emotional thing about which one to pick didn't even matter anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I try to, I try to keep people focused on the, on the goal. And I just keep trying to remind myself to show up for one reason and one reason only. And that is for the purpose of doing what I was brought on, brought on to do. Right. Right. I've, I've had some wins with buyers for sellers who got a little emotional though. I have to say. We've, we've kind oh of yeah. Me too. When I represent buyers for sure. Yeah. It's not something it's, it, it's not something to be taken lightly. I think, um, I don't know. I think maybe they got 20. Well, no, I think, yeah, they got, I was going to say 25,000, but it was more like about 200. I had a seller that received multiple offers on a property and he read the letters and said, you know, this couple reminds me of me and my wife when we bought this house and we were stretching to get it. And we, we you know, scraped, scraped together and raised our two kids in this house. And uh, I don't care about the other um, developer that wants to buy this property um, um, at any price. Um, and I, I really got to experience on such an intimate level, how someone can feel so emotionally attached to the, um, the nurturing energy that a home has um, and that it had for him and his family, that he didn't want to sell it to somebody who was going to tear it down and build some big new box mm -hmm. because he knew that the energy that was innate with that house had a value that for him was greater than any amount of money. Um, so ultimately I still negotiated those, you know, the individual buyer up um, so that they were competitive um, because I didn't want my client to walk away from money. So you can still have, could still have the yeah. emotional feeling or connection um, without, um, sacrificing the money that you're trying to make out of the deal. Um, but those are decisions that I can't make and I don't make. All I do, I mean, I, I, I'm not here to, to, to help steer a seller to accept one person's offer over the other, unless the price and the terms are great. Otherwise it's all, I mean, it's not what we're supposed to do. I mean, I, I but I'm, we're not supposed to discriminate against who we like better than one or the other. We're here to get, stay on task and help our clients who are selling homes, sell their home for the highest possible price. And sometimes things come up and I'm like, you know what, that's off the table. And I think maybe because I, sh I am a Brown person and they catch that I'm like, that's sort of, that's bias. Um, that they, when they hear it coming from me, as we are going through the offers, they're like, oh, 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 right. <laughs> and then I keep them on track. What? And that's how I get my clients the most, you know, get them really great prices. And you, you did mention, um, something kind of made me think of like the soul of the house or the essence of the house and, um, there, there 
that is kind of the, the bummer about new builds is you don't get that kind of that good energy of people that have really enjoyed living there. I just sold a, a home that was rented forever, but these renters were happy there and they, they, that energy in that house was really good. And I know that my buyers wanted some of that, wanted some of that energy that was there, but I've also noticed that some of the bad energy in houses where people stayed too long and I'm guilty of that. I stayed in a house for way too long. I that just wasn't, it just wasn't where I was supposed to be. And Let then, go, walk away from the building. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, and it's funny because then I talk sometimes to the agent who sold my house and she's like, oh my God, my buyer loves it. It's like, he's going to die there. And it's just like, oh, I was so over that place. So it's, that's interesting that I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a podcast with a, a local spirit person about uh oh fantastic i think that should be really interesting because there's there's also i i i know you feel it too we don't even have time to get into that but that whole um the, the whole the energy part of 100 percent. i've i've had energy cleansings uh, in homes and yeah. it's amazing i had this one that was just a lot of a lot of chaotic energy and a lot of chaotic conversations and feuding between the couple that own the home and the painter and then the electrician and then the stager and every step of the way it was just um challenging and um finally i had an energy um person do a, a cleansing and we got a bunch of offers <laughs> on the house and, and it sold really well um, but it wasn't until it happened that there was a shift um, in everyone's communication, like people that I had no no dealing with because it wasn't my gardener, it wasn't my electrician, it was the clients. You know, they were communicating directly with their own people, and there was, and all of a sudden, everything seemed to magically just like so the confusion cord got cut, and everything went into harmony and fell into place. Yeah. Um, I know we're in California, so it's all woo-woo California realtors, but <laughs> I think there's a lot to it, you know. A lot of attractions real. I can tell you a funny story is I actually saged and smudged a house myself because I felt that the seller needed to move on. He passed away in the property. And uh I think actually I did the reverse and convinced him to stay. Um, there was just these breezes that were coming through during the open houses and door shutting. I was like, oh, I did it wrong. So get <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> well, that is all I have for questions for you. I really appreciate it right. on. And well, thank you for asking me. I hope, uh, I hope I said something that sounded smart. <laughs> <laughs> Something you can edit out and just <laughs> we covered just about everything except for uh rats, which seem to be everywhere, but we've covered just about everything. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited for clients and, and referring them to you. Um I I I I think you have a lot of integrity and a good heart and I I think it's really important. And if people don't want that, that's great. They can hire the person that works for them. But this is who I I partner with just like you do. We we partner with our clients, um, we bring our brand of expertise to to our, our experience and our, the transaction and um, the people that want to partner with someone competent, um, that they show up, they're going to keep on showing up. Yep. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm saving my money. I'm going to talk a lot of realtors. Everybody's kind of stuffing their money under the mattress at this point. But it was great to talk with you. And um, are you in Sonoma now? Did you get up there? No, no, no. I'm uh, heading there right after this. Okay, well, I'll let you go. And thank you again. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a great night. Cheers. Hey, thank you for listening. If you want to talk more, find me on livethesantacruzlife.com, on YouTube, on Twitter on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or give me a call. My number's in the show notes. Love to hear from you.